This is the week 13 material for Bio 5, and this week we're scaling way up and covering evolution. So this is actually still a continuation of genetics. We're thinking about genetics within a population. So we're kind of just scaling up in terms of the organisms that we're looking at at one time. Um, this is, again, kind of why lab and lecture sometimes don't always line up, because we have to cover a much different set of material in lecture than we do in lab. So just a reminder on that. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, well, first the end of the semester and then evolution. So in terms of the end of the semester, we have one more week of material, then you have your uh, lab practical, and then the following week is fall break. Um, fall break is at the end of the week, so at the beginning of the week you still have class technically. Um, Clemencia will be there to pass, or not pass back your lab practicals, but go over them if you'd like to see your grades. And then I'll be hosting a review session in the lab room at that time. Um, I posted your reflection already. And so for the reflection this week, we're really focusing on preparing for the lab practical and the lecture final exam, which will take place in the lab room the following week on December 3rd. Um, so we have another week of material, you have the lab practical, we have a review day, and then you have the lecture final. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that and to the semester coming to a close. I also wanted to do a little bit of instructor talk about evolution um, because this is a challenging topic for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about evolution and I've kind of structured the first part of the lecture um, of the actual chapters around some of those common misconceptions about evolution. Um, and I know there's a lot of scientists who kind of uh, degrade people who don't understand science um, or who haven't had the privilege of having a background in science. A lot of people are raised by scientists or people with um, a traditional formal educational background, um, but not everyone is. And a lot of us get other kinds of education from different places, from our families, our friends, our communities, our places of worship. Um, and so we all have prior knowledge that's coming from somewhere. And sometimes it's easy to work that into our education, sometimes it's not. Um, and sometimes with evolution, it clashes. So I just wanted to say, first of all, that my very best friend in the whole world is one of the most devout Christians I know. Um, I'm personally somewhere between agnostic and Muslim, uh, and a lot of my family are Catholic. That being said, I'm able to hold evolution uh, equal with my faith, and so is my best friend. She's a PhD student in New Zealand right now, <laughs> lucky her, um, but she's doing her PhD in marine biology. She's a scientist and a devout Christian, and she definitely uh, agrees with evolution. So it's something where it's not based on belief. Um, it's something that we look at evidence, we apply the scientific method, and evolution doesn't seek to explain how the world was created, how life exists, it's just kind of like after life exists, what next? How do we get this amazing biodiversity that we have? Um, so that's the thing about science is it doesn't take away from faith or just how magical the world is. I mean, if anything, science makes you appreciate how crazy it is to be alive and how crazy complex we are um, and just what a miracle life is. Uh, so I hope that you keep that in mind um, and I hope that you approach this lecture with an open mind if you do have some hesitations about evolution. Also, as people who are intending to be clinicians, um, evolution, especially microevolution, plays a very important role in something called antibiotic resistance, which is what we're going to start the lecture out with. Um, so usually I do this as kind of like a worksheet in my classes. Um, I'm going to encourage you to pause the lecture at blank spaces that you see and kind of work through this case study at the beginning, um, just so you can kind of understand where we're coming from. So again, we're kind of doing a pre-assessment, thinking about the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And this gift that's playing right now is a bunch of bacteria growing in an auger plate and developing antibiotic resistance through the process of evolution.
So first, you should understand what antibiotics actually are. I'm sure a lot of you have taken them or had family members that have taken them. Um, they are drugs that target specific structures on bacteria to treat and prevent bacterial infections. Uh, I noticed that a lot of you are missing the question on the quiz about genotype versus phenotype. So genotype is directly what's in your DNA. It's what types of alleles you have, what forms of genes you have, your type of genes. Phenotype is the physical protein structure. So that protein might be something like my brown eyes, but it could also be an enzyme I produce, like lactase to break down the sugar or lactose. Uh, so when we talk about structures, sometimes they're extracellular and sometimes they're intracellular, but they're all kind of protein based. So those structures might be uh, things that are involved in protein synthesis, like ribosome subunits. Uh, they could be specific enzymes that are involved in nucleic acid synthesis or DNA replication, like DNA gyrase and R, uh, or RNA polymerase, which is involved in transcription. Um, so these structures can be lots of different things. Um, but the actual drugs include things like penicillin, amoxicillin, methicillin, isoniazide, fluoroquinolones, tetracycline, and rifampin. Those are some common antibiotics that you might have heard of before. So we're going to look at these two very simplified bacteria, and these are two individual bacteria that are of the same species. So we can pretend they're E. coli or Staphylococcus aureus, um, but they cause an infection in humans. So I'm gonna have you pause the lecture and answer what is one small difference about them. So you should notice that the one on the left has a moon-shaped receptor and the one on the right has an L-shaped or angular receptor. Um, remember that receptors are things that are on the outside of cells that help receive information, different chemical signals from outside of the cells. So let's say that this is what the population looks like, and we take an antibiotic or a drug that kills all of the bacteria with a moon-shaped receptor in a population. So go ahead and pretend to cross out which bacteria you think will be killed. Okay, so your population should look something like this. So all of the bacteria with the moon-shaped receptor were killed, but there were a couple that remained um, that were had the other receptor. Um, so remember, bacteria reproduce really quickly. They go through binary fission, and they're able to quickly make copies of themselves. So go ahead and sketch out just very simply how you think the population of bacteria will look after a few rounds of division, so binary fission or asexual cellular reproduction. So hopefully you understand that those two bacteria that survived made copies of themselves, and now the entire population looks like this. Um, so last part, what do you think, or what would you call this process? And then also, do you think the same drug will work to get rid of this infection? So some words that we might use to describe this process are evolution, change over time, adaptation, environmental selection, natural selection, and change of populations over time. Um, when we're using adaptation here, we're using it kind of as a verb rather than a noun. We're going to define it as a noun in a little bit. Also, no, the same drug would not work because the structure that it's targeting is not even in the population anymore. So this idea of a bacterial population evolving resistance to an antibiotic is very common and very serious. It's called antibiotic resistance and it's a major problem in our country and the world. Um, so antibiotics are really important. They're produced and used by bacteria and fungi. So if you look at this auger plate on the right side of the screen, um, this is a kind of gelatin matrix, not actually gelatin, but it's some material um, called auger uh, that 
is able to be heated a little bit better than gelatin. Um, it uh, is basically like if I made a couch for you out of in and out it's a structure to live on and sit on, but also to eat and grow on when you mix another material. Anyway, it's great for growing bacteria and fungi. Um, so if we were to sample kind of like outside a building and then swabbed it all over this plate, we would grow bacteria. And it just so happened that when some of my students grew this, um, there was this one type of bacterium. You can see a colony of it right here, which is just tons and tons of cells packed on each other from one original cell making clones of itself. Um, and then there's this other type of bacterium, uh, Bacillus mycoides, that's kind of making this wavy thing all around here. But the Bacillus mycoides can only grow up to this point, so it can't grow any further. And the reason for that is this bacterium in the center is making an antibiotic um, that is kind of spreading out and preventing that Bacillus mycoides from growing any closer. So these antibiotics are really important for like interbacterial warfare. Uh, they prevent other bacteria from encroaching and taking their space, their food, their resources. So it inhibits the growth of bacteria and fungi to avoid competition for space and resources. So we use antibiotics, we isolate them and use them or synthesize them in the lab for many different health reasons. Um, it's really great for them to be prescribed. It's not so great for them to be taken over the counter, but you can go to the store and get azo um, or neosporin or bacitracin. Bacitracin especially is really common after you get tattoos. Um, and we use them all the time, but it's not good because you're exposing populations of bacteria, including good populations of bacteria in your body to antibiotics. You're killing some of those good bacteria and you're encouraging the growth of resistance to bacteria. So that's one important point I wanna make is that there are naturally occurring bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, but they don't make up the whole population until you use antibiotics enough and encourage the growth of just those bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics. So antibiotics are such an important tool, but they're massively overprescribed and people use them incorrectly all the time. Um, my family went to Pakistan over the summer. My husband is a pharmacist and he was so excited when we were in the pharmacy. He could buy any type of antibiotic he wanted um, just over the counter. And there's much stricter uh, prescribing patterns in the United States, still not strict enough. Um, but he just went wild buying all these antibiotics that you're not supposed to just use left and right. Anyway, um, so just to kind of help visualize that antibiotic resistance. Um, so there's lots of bacteria, lots of germs, and only a few are drug resistant. We take antibiotics, they kill the bacteria causing the illness, as well as some good bacteria, but those antibiotics that are resistant already, maybe they don't have the enzyme we're targeting, maybe it's a little bit different, um, they survive and they take over. And not only that, they can also pass on the antibiotic resistance to other bacteria. So these entire populations of bacteria in our body that cause infections become resistant to antibiotics, and we can't use those tools to protect us anymore. So this is a huge problem in the United States. About 2 million people every year become infected with in resistant bacteria, and 23,000 people die from these types of infections. So it's not just an inconvenience in terms of treating, it's actually killing people. And especially if you're working with immunocompromised patients, this can be a really serious issue. So just to visualize how quickly this happens. Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of checkpoints and proofreading mechanisms. A lot of bacteria don't have those. They just mutate really quickly because they're able to replicate so quickly. They don't go through sexual reproduction to get genetic variation. So it benefits them to have mutations and variation within their population. Um, so this is an actual time-lapse video of bacteria growing on a giant auger plate about the size of a large desk. Um, and it has increasingly strong and varied types of antibiotics with each panel. So you can see initially the bacteria grows and takes over the first panel, and then a single bacterium mutates and is able to spread over the whole next panel and so on. So this 
Resistance evolves fairly quickly over the span of about a week. So just so you're aware of some human behaviors that encourage antibiotic resistance, um, one of them is misuse. So for example, if you are prescribed antibiotics or if you are prescribing antibiotics to a patient, it is crucial to finish them. The patient has to know that every single antibiotic they are given, they have to take um, according to their doctor's prescribing pattern. Um, and there should never be leftover antibiotics, but you should also never take antibiotics that don't belong to you. So taking somebody else's medicine is a very bad idea. Um, I've seen people get on Facebook and be like, hey, I have an ear infection. Can I um, get any antibiotics from someone? And that's so shady and so bad. Um, also, people try to use antibiotics a lot to treat viral infections. So for example, the flu or the common cold, they try to get antibiotics for that. You need antivirals for that and you need the right kind of antiviral and it's just not a good idea. Um, a lot of factory farming relies on antibiotics uh, to keep, for example, chickens that are packed close together um, in good condition because de disease transmission is really common in those situations. Um, and uh, also there's some association with taking antibiotics and being able to kind of pack on more muscle for certain types of animals. That being said, we're not worried about the antibiotics getting into the meat. We're worried about the drug resistant bacterial populations on the meat that sometimes get onto our shopping bags or there's cross contamination or into groundwater. That's what we're concerned about. Um, also, overuse of antibacterial products like ointments and soap, uh, it's just as effective to just wash your hands with normal soap and water. You don't need antibacterial soap. And also, sometimes people have to take antibiotics long term, especially if they have something like tuberculosis. Um, and so in that case, you might have increased types of antibiotic resistance. So try to avoid these practices and try to encourage your patients to avoid these practices. Um, but now let's get into the actual evolutionary processes, kind of talking about the background information here and some evidence behind evolution. So we're going to start out with section one, understanding evolution. So defining some key terms, deconstructing misconceptions, going over types of evidence, specifically homologous structures, comparative embryology and vestigial structures. We'll then get into formation of new species, so defining biological species and a hybrid, uh, and distinguishing prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. So I wanted to first talk about some common misconceptions about evolution. Misconception one is that evolution is just a theory. Misconception two is that individuals evolve. Misconception three is that evolution explains the origins of life. And misconception four is that organisms evolve on purpose. So none of these are true. Um, and as I walk my way through some of the evidence about evolution and just some basic information about it, I'm going to come back to these as miss one, miss two, miss three, and miss four. And so these little uh, stars will be in the top right corner um, when we go over a piece of information that kind of helps deconstruct one of these misconceptions. And we're gonna start out with misconception one, this idea that evolution is just a theory. That misconception just really has to do with the language of biology and how it's different from day-to-day -day conversation. So this is the difference between a hypothesis and a theory in science. When you go into a lab class where you're doing experiment, experiments, you make hypotheses every single day. It's just a very tentative explanation. You might have some evidence, some reason for thinking the way that you do, um, but it's very basic and you don't have to really have any support behind it. It's just, you know, you're just spitballing like this is what I think is going to happen and why. So uh, an example of this in just day-to-day -day conversation might be, if I take my dog for a walk, then she will stop barking. Or if I replace the batteries on my flashlight, then it will work. Um, it's a hypothesis or a prediction. That being said, a theory in, in science is something completely different. It's something that's really well established. We have tons of evidence for it, maybe decades or hundreds of years of data to support it, lots of different types of experiments. 
Um, so some examples of theories in science are this idea that germs cause disease, that life is made out of cells, that gravity exists, and that evolution works. So all of these are theories. Um, so in science, a theory means something totally different than a hypothesis. Um, in day-to-day -day conversation, we use them interchangeably. Like for example, if a detective on a show is like, oh, I have a theory about how this guy got killed. In science, they don't have a theory. They have a hypothesis. So misconception three is about the origin of life and whether evolution seeks to explain it. So what do we actually mean by evolution? Evolution is just change over time. More specifically, it's change of a population over time, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, some of those changes might be obvious, some of them aren't. So some of them might be microevolution, some of them might be macroevolution. Um, and the Earth is also extremely old. And I think people have trouble conceptualizing just how ancient the Earth is. Um, so for example, the last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth existed 4 billion years ago. That's just a crazy amount of time and very hard for us to conceptualize. So if you have kids or think back to when you were a kid um, driving in the car, an hour feels like an eternity. But now you sit through a three hour lab with reasonably no problems. You know, our perception of time is relative. So we can understand one year or five years or 10 years or 30 years. Uh, but it's very hard for us to imagine the passage of 200 years or a thousand years or 4 billion years. Um, so just to kind of help put that into perspective, uh, let's say that the entire existence of Earth from its formation to the current day is a 24 hour clock. So at midnight, Earth was created. Um, the last universal common ancestor existed at about 8 a.m. Um, at about just before 11 a.m., that's when life start, or the Earth started to have more oxygen. Uh, life transitioned to land at about 9 p.m. Um, the dinosaurs appeared at about uh, almost 11 p.m. Um, and then uh, humans existed with less than a minute to the next midnight. Uh, so we have not been around for hardly any time. Uh, it's so hard to conceptualize just how long we've had to accumulate changes. Um, and so that being said, we don't, uh, as part of evolution, we don't try to explain how that life got here. We just think, okay, there was a universal common ancestor, a general cell type, and life has diversified immensely since that point. So evolution is going from that last universal common ancestor to the diversity that we have today. It's not explaining how the universal ancestor got here. Um, there are some really interesting experiments called the Yuri Miller experiments. Uh, I encourage you to look them up. They're kind of about the early conditions of life on Earth. Um, also RNA hypothesis. There's a lot of cool ideas out there, but uh, evolution doesn't try to explain that. So misconception four was that things evolve on purpose or that evolution happens on purpose. And it doesn't, it just kind of happens. Um, and it relies on existing genetic diversity or variation. So that genetic diversity can come from mutations. It can come from genetic recombination. So um, from meiosis, uh, we've talked about crossing over and independent assortment fertilization and sexual reproduction, um, and there's this existing variation and then competition between that variation. So some traits that are coded for by existing genetic variation perform better than others. Um, and so there is a really cute dog and a really cute cheetah cub on this slide for a reason. First, you should know that cheetahs are super neurotic and don't do well in zoos but they do great if they are raised at the same time as a puppy. Um, so the puppy is paired up with the cheetah and the dog kind of uh, helps keep them ordered and less neurotic and, and the cheetah gives the dog something to do, a task. Um, so they grow up together, they're raised together and they have this synergistic relationship, which is just adorable um, and a great use of science. 
but also cheetahs are a really genetic example uh, because they went through a bottleneck event, which I'll get back to in just a moment, but they don't have a lot of diversity. Um, so reproductive strategies are really important with cheetahs. Um, so for example, if a female cheetah mates with multiple males, her cubs have a lot of variety, um, a lot of variability in their genetics, and the chance that all of them will die because of the same, let's say, pathogen, an infective agent, uh, is very low because there's a lot of diversity there. But if a female cheetah meets with only one male, there will be less diversity amongst her offspring, and then all of them might be more susceptible to that pathogen. Um, so here we're starting to look at this idea that it's not an individual that's going to go, go super well or do super well, it's the population as a whole. Um, so we're not thinking about individuals evolving, we're thinking about the population, and this is not happening on purpose. It's just there's diversity and sometimes stuff works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, that bottleneck event that I'm talking about, uh, the cheetahs went through a situation where their population size dropped dramatically. Uh, that decreased the amount of diversity they had. Um, they're kind of in this weird period of maybe they'll recover, maybe extinction. Um, so you can recover and rebound in population size, but from that point on, you have very limited genetic diversity. So cheetahs are an interesting example of genetics. So getting into this idea about evolution changing the population, not the individual, um, let's say we're looking at this population of beetles where some of them are brown and some of them are green. Um, so there's variation. Uh, some of them are on the tree and the brown ones happen to blend in with the tree a lot better. Maybe the green ones do really well on the leaves, but maybe a lot of the beetles are distributed across the tree. So a predator, the bird, is able to see those green ones better than the brown ones. Um, and so there's differential reproduction. The brown ones are going to reach reproductive age and reproduce more than the green ones. And over time, the population is going to look more and more brown and less and less green. So it's not that this green beetle is de-evolving and the brown beetle is evolving, it's just that the brown beetle is reproducing more than the green beetle. So over sequential generations, which are a unit of time, the population is going to look more and more like the survivors, the brown beetles. So in terms of the mechanism of evolution, this is, we uh, think it's natural selection. Um, so this is this idea of having differential survival and reproductions of individuals due to differences in phenotype. Um, and so it's very important here that that phenotype is related to your genotype. It's coded for by your DNA. Um, so individuals are different. Some individuals survive natural conditions better than others. And survivors pass on their alleles, their specific forms of genes. Uh, so this is important. Um, if someone survives because they are super ripped and have a lot of muscle, that's not necessarily something that they can pass on to their offspring um, and that will then kind of change the population as a result. Uh, it, uh, muscle physiology is a little bit weird. I, it could be, but it also could be just because they worked out a lot. Um, if they have some random mutation that happens after they've already been born or it happens in uh, kind of cells that are not passed on to their offspring, so in their gametes, it might benefit them, but if it's not passed on to their offspring, it's not going to be part of this process of evolution. So it has to be um, able to be passed on to their offspring in the gametes in their DNA. And if we meet that requirement, over time we see these changes in allele frequencies within the whole population. So again, this is happening on the scale of generations within the population, not individuals. Um, so this is kind of confusing because oftentimes in, uh, in like popular culture, we think about mutations as being these like extremely positive, good things that like, you know, X-Men, that can be, you know, gain of function mutations do happen, but it's much more likely that you'll have a typo that makes something go wrong than go right. Um, and so mutations are often 
uh, not great, but they can be. They contribute to variability. Um, also, this idea of evolution and changing and a species evolving is not just one magical X-Men evolving. It's the whole population just very gradually changing. So when we talk about adaptations, these are heritable traits, so they can be passed on to future offspring that helps an orga organism's survival and reproduction in its present environment. So that's really important because something can be an adaptation uh, in one environment and it can be not so helpful in another environment. So you might have heard of Charles Darwin, who pioneered this idea of natural selection. You might have heard of the Galapagos finches, which are also called Darwin's finches. Um, there are these different birds that are very closely related to one another on a bunch of islands, the Galapagos Islands. Um, and they all have very different beaks that happen to match up with the dominant food source on that particular island. Um, and so that allowed them to kind of diversify and coexist in this small space um, by having adaptations to different food sources. Um, so one beak type might do really great at a certain canopy level on a certain island. It's not necessarily going to be an adaptation if you're living on a different island. So the environment really makes a difference and having a lot of variation um, helps the population as a whole, even though sometimes one type, one uh, trait is good in a particular environment um, and others aren't. If the environment changes, the ones that aren't good might then become adaptations in a different environment. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, and when we talk about survival of the fittest in terms of natural selection, um, we're not talking about whoever has the most muscle or is the tallest. We're talking about who reproduces. So fitness and genetics has nothing to do with your physical appearance. It has to do with your number of offspring. Um, and it's also influenced by your relative's offspring. So for example, uh, if your cousin has uh, a bunch of children, if, let's say, I think it's uh, the ratio ends up being eight children. If your cousin has eight children, then that's the same as you having one child. Um, so we all have a degree of relatedness. Um, we all share DNA with our relatives. And so if they reproduce, that contributes to our overall fitness. So I also wanted to touch on this idea of natural selection versus artificial selection. Um, so in natural se selection, the environment is the selective factor. So for example, in this case with a bunch of caribou, um, the selective factor might be coldness or food availability. Um, it could be a pathogen. It could be any matter of thing in which the environment is selecting. It could be a predator, something like that. In artificial selection, it's still the same basic mechanism, but humans are now the selective factor. So if we look at cattle from 1900 until 2000, we see that the same species might look quite different because we've selected for meat production. Um, dairy cattle, we select for milk production. Um, it's the same uh, with like wild mustard. So for example, uh, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, none of those exist in the wild. They all come from wild mustard and humans have just artificially selected different components of that over time to make those different vegetables. So we are applying a selective factor in these situations, same with antibiotic resistance. Okay, so getting into some pieces of evidence for evolution, um, the first is fossils and biogeographical studies, so recognizing uh, similar fossils in different areas, different migration patterns. We're not going to touch on that today because it's less to do with biology. We're going to focus more on anatomical structures and embryonic development. Um, and then this idea of modern synthesis was after we had bigger data sets of DNA in the 1960s and 70s, um, as well as proteins and other biological molecules, we put those ideas together that's this idea of modern synthesis. So we're really gonna focus in this lecture on anatomical structures and embryonic development. So the first piece of evidence is homologous structures. Um, so for example, we have basically the exact same bones as dogs, 
in our arms and hands, we have the exact same bones as other mammals like cats and whales and bats. Cats walk on all fours. They're not bipedal like us. Um, whales swim in the ocean. Bats fly in the sky. But we all have the same bones. They're just kind of elongated or condensed in different ways to fulfill different functional roles. And the reason we have all the same bones is because we had a common ancestor that had all of those bones. So homologous structures are evidence of shared ancestry between different um, different organisms, different structures, different genes uh, in different taxa. And taxa are just evolutionary relationships or um, different lineages. Um, so for example, different species, different genera, different classes or families. Um, so this speaks to descent with modification from a common ancestor. Um, we have different lineages changing in different ways, but we all share the same homologous structures because we come from the same ancestor. So they reveal this idea of common descent. Um, we have experienced different, our ancestors experienced different selective pressures in each small little niche. Um, and so these have led to accumulated changes in bone structure um, so that bats were able to evolve wings. Birds were also able to evolve wings separately. Lions walk on all fours, humans walk upright, and seals and whales swim in the ocean. Homologous structures also help point out another misconception that I've heard before and actually got into an argument with someone on about on Facebook, um, but this is the idea that if we evolve from monkeys, why are monkeys still around? So I'm sure a lot of you have siblings and cousins and grandparents, and when you popped into existence, those other individuals didn't pop out of existence. So having a common ancestor doesn't mean one of you disappears. You have siblings, you have cousins, you have a common ancestor with them. You're related to them. Um, so it's again this idea of descent with modification. So for example, chimpanzees are our closest relative. It's like we share parents. They're kind of like our genetic siblings. Um, gorillas are a little bit more distantly related. It's like we share grandparents with them. So they're um, kind of like our cousins. And orangutans are more distantly related. We share great grandparents. Um, so obviously it's not as close as parents or grandparents, but in a big millions of years scale, um, that's kind of the degree of relatedness. So another piece of evidence is this idea of comparative embryology, looking at very different embryos and seeing similarities between them. So these structures might be found in the embryos, but not in the adult form. So it's important to look at the entire life history to see those residual evolutionary similarities. Examples of these include notochords and gill slits that are found in organisms that don't breathe underwater anymore. Um, so for example, if we look at embryos of humans, monkeys, pigs, chickens, and salamanders, all these organisms are quite different. Um, but we see similarities at them in early stages of development. So uh, it's also important to compare across very different life history stages. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have not heard of tunicates, but they're really interesting marine creatures. They're invertebrates. Um, they're very vibrant. Uh, they're also super interesting. They can like fuse their circulatory systems between different organisms. Um, the one on the bottom is called sea vomit, uh, didymnum vexillum. Um, a lot of these are fouling organisms, so they grow on ships and on piers and can be uh, kind of detrimental that way. But in their larval stage, they look like this, and they have a notochord, which is very similar to our spinal cord um, in early stages of development. Uh, the adults definitely don't look like this, but the larvae do. So we have to compare our own development to their larval stage, and they're considered our closest living invertebrate relative. Another piece of, evident, of evidence are vestigial structures. Um, so if you've ever heard the term the last vestiges of something, it's kind of what's remaining. Um, they're not useful to us, but they were useful to our ancestors. So they're kind of holdovers from early evolutionary state 
So for example, you've probably experienced bumping your tailbone, which is really painful. That's your coccyx. It's a very specific type of bone. Um, we don't have tails, but we have tail bones because our ancestors had tails and those structures were eventually reduced over time. Um, a lot of the population have vestigial nipples where um, they might serve non-reproductive purposes, but they are not necessarily helpful for lactation and for raising offspring. Um, they're vestigial. So vestigial structures have lost their function, but they're homologous to a still functional structure in another species. Um, another example is our nails. So yes, you can scratch someone with your nails and it can hurt. Baby nails hurt a whole lot. Um, but if you compare that to the nails on like a large dog or a tiger, uh, they are really not as helpful. So our nails are vestigial compared to a lot of other organisms. Another interesting uh, vestigial structure are hip and leg bones inside of whales. So whales obviously don't have legs, they don't have hips, but they do have hip and leg bones. And the reason for that is whales actually are descended from land animals. Um, life emerged in the ocean and then transitioned to land, but some organisms went back to the ocean. Um, so whales are descended from land animals that walked on four legs and had a pelvis. Over time, they returned to the water. Maybe their habitat became more and more aquatic. Maybe they were escaping predators or uh, trying to find food sources, but they returned to the water. Um, and the features that helped them swim and survive underwater were then selected for. So the organisms with bigger flippers or reduced legs, because their energy was going to other stuff, were able to reproduce more and survive. Um, so structures that are no longer useful are reduced and no longer functional, but might still be present. Those hip and leg bones are vestigial structures and they're still present in whales. I also wanted to talk about this interesting case study that speaks to misconceptions too about individuals versus the population and for evolution happening on purpose. Um, so if you look at these moths, uh, so there's, um, see there is one right here this darker pattern uh, the darker pattern is also located right here there is a lighter moth right here and a lighter moth right here and obviously the darker moth blends in better in the dark tree and the whiter moth blends in better in the whiter tree um, so if you look at just uh, this situation up here it can be confusing as to why the dark moth exists at all. So let's walk through this. Um, these are called black peppered moths. They're very, they're a, a particular morph of the same species as the white moths. They were very rare in the early 1800s uh, because the white pepper moths blend in better with the trees and they survived predation better. But then the industrial revolution happened. People uh, started mass producing items and burning a lot of stuff and producing soot. So the trees became covered in soot and became a lot darker. Um, and so at that point, the black pepper moth became much more common. So it was able to survive and reproduce better than the white pepper moth. Um, and so it existed in the population more. It survived predation. That allele frequency that coded for that darker pepper moth survived better and uh, the population consisted of more of it. But then clean air standards happened, and so the trees got less sooty over time, and now those black pepper moth numbers are falling again. So if the black peppered morph hadn't existed in the population, if its alleles uh, had been completely removed from the population, and it, we just had the white pepper moths, after the Industrial Revolution, the population would have been decimated, but because there was existing variation, the population was able to survive and bounce back. So that existing variation is good for the population as a whole, even if it's bad for individuals. So again, evolution is about the population surviving, not the individual.
Evolution can also have very different effects. Um, so the examples we've given were kind of divergent evolution, this idea that two species evolve in very diverse directions from a common point. There's also convergent evolution. So converging together, similar appearances or traits or phenotypes evolve independently in very distantly related species. So for example, uh, the sugar glider is this cute little marsupial. Um, it's pictured on the left of the right image. Um, it has the stripe on its forehead. It's a marsupial. It lives in Australia um, and it reproduces kind of similar to kangaroos uh, and wallabies, stuff like that. Um, and then the flying squirrel that lives in North America is a mammal. They look very similar. They both have those kind of wings for gliding from tree limb to tree limb, uh, but they evolve those completely separately of one another. Um, bats and birds and insects all fly, but they uh, evolved that ability separate from one another. So those are all examples of convergent evolution. Okay, so when we get into this idea of a species, there's lots of different definitions, but the basic biological definition is a group of individual organisms that interbreed with one another and produce fertile, viable offspring. Um, so they generally share external and internal characteristics due to similarities in their DNA. That's not always the case. Um, and speciation may or may not occur due to geographical barriers. So it could be because they're separated. It could be because they stop reproducing for other reasons. Getting back to that external characteristics thing, uh, you might think about dogs, which look very different from one another. So for example, poodles and cocker spaniels and terriers all look quite different, but all could reproduce. That being said, there are some prezygotic barriers to uh, reproduction. For example, um, it'd be very surprising if a Great Dane and a Chihuahua were able to reproduce. Um, so that's an example where uh, if you brought the egg and sperm together, they probably could reproduce, but it's a little bit challenging to get the sperm to the egg. Um, so there's some barriers that we'll talk about in just a moment. Also, there's a lot of dogs that have been artificially selected and can't reproduce and can't um, uh, get pregnant or uh, have babies on their own because their bodies have been so um, just, uh, I don't even know the right term that I'm trying to think of, but just like so violated through this process of artificial selection. Um, and so that's another thing, like you need, really need to have responsible, diverse breeding programs if you are interested in purebred dogs uh, because pure breeding really does a number on bo dog body types and ability to survive. Um, that being said, this in terms of these like external characteristics, these two eagles, um, the bald eagle on the bottom right and the other type of eagle, look exactly the same but are not the same species of eagle and can't reproduce with one another. So we're gonna focus first on this idea of fertile offspring and then the, the idea of interbreeding. Um, so when we're thinking about fertile offspring, these are offspring that are able to reproduce in the future. So for example, uh, horses and donkeys can actually reproduce and produce viable offspring, which are called mules. Um, mules have a lot of desirable characteristics. They're really strong and built like horses, but uh, they can be similar to donkeys in some ways. They're very sturdy. Um, so they have a lot of desirable characteristics from both of those organisms, but they're not fertile. Mules can't reproduce. So we don't consider donkeys and horses to be the same species because they don't produce viable fertile offspring. Ligers are also actually real. They're half lion, half tiger. Um, they're also hybrids. They can't reproduce on their own um, or they can't reproduce at all. Uh, so we don't consider lions and tigers to be the same species. In terms of interbreeding, there are prezygotic, so before we get to a zygote, and postzygotic, after the zygote is created, um, barriers to breeding. 
Um, so for example, if organisms are separated in different habitats, if they reproduce at different times of year or even times of day, um, if their behavior prevents them from reproducing, um, if their genitals don't match up, and if their gametes can't interact with one another, those are all considered prezygotic barriers. Postzygotic barriers prevent that offspring, that zygote, from becoming a viable fertile adult. Um, so they could have reduced viability, they could have reduced fertility, um, different ways of them not surviving to the point of being viable fertile offspring. So prezygotic is before we have a zygote, before we have fertilization. Postzygotic is after fertilization. Okay, so we're going to briefly talk about chapter 19, Evolution of Populations. So we'll start by distinguishing between micro and macro evolution, defining allele frequency and genetic structure, and then get into founder effect. Um, we'll look at a case study of founder effect and then distinguish between different types of selection. So it's important to remember that evolution occurs on different scales. Microevolution is basic change in a population over time. So for example, like the development of antibiotic resistance that we saw. Macroevolution are processes that give rise to new species and higher taxonomic groups with very divergent characteristics. So for example, uh, going from the last universal common ancestor to all the organisms today. Population genetics is this idea where we're looking at changes in allele and genotype frequencies within the population, and it's more mathematic and quantitative in approach. We're looking at allele frequency or gene frequency, which is the rate at which a very specific allele appears within a population. Um, usually we simplify it and just look at two alleles at a given time. Uh, we also look at the gene pool, which is the sum of all of the alleles in a population. And this idea of founder effect, which influences allele frequency, um, is going from one population to a new population. The original population might be very uh, diverse with many, many different types of alleles. But if just a couple of colonizers go to a new location um, and they are less diverse than the original population, their descendants will reflect that lack of diversity. So um, the founder effect is some event, some colonization that initiates an allele frequency change in an isolated part of the population, which does not reflect the original diversity of the original population. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to introduce you to this idea of the Hardy-Weinberg principle of equilibrium. This is much more common in like bio 11, so general biology for majors. Um, but just so you know, uh, it's kind of this way that we conceptualize uh, stable populations um, and compare them to real populations to see the genetic structure of the real population, how different it is from this like pure example of Hardy-Weinberg um, which assumes that there's no mutations, no migration or emigration, no selective pressure for or against a trait or genotype, and an infinite population. Um, so don't stress about this too much. I just wanted to briefly bring it up. I did also want to talk about this example of, um, of Dutch colonists in South Africa um, who have a much higher rate of Huntington's disease than the rest of the world. Um, Huntington's disease is caused by this uh, CAG codon repeat, which is repeated anywhere from 45 to over 100 times, um, and it causes really severe uh, neurological pro uh, problems. It's a degenerative condition, um, and it unfortunately emerges kind of later in life after people have reproduced already, um, and it's genetic. So uh, people often pass it on to their family members before they even realize they have it. And uh, with a lot of these conditions, we didn't understand the genetic basis of them until fairly recently. So for a long time, people have passed on these conditions um, without understanding why their relatives were dying. 
Um, so it turns out that the original colonists of South Africa um, have higher rates of this Huntington's disease mutation um, and also Fanconi anemia, which causes blood marrow abnormalities, congenital abnormalities, and cancer. Um, and so this is a serious example of founder effect where we're not just looking at like uh, basic physical appearances, we're looking at very serious rare diseases that are much more common. Um, Huntington's disease causes a lot of uncontrolled movements, um, it causes a lot of behavioral changes, and then very serious neurological breakdown. Um, there's also different types of selection on a alleles within a population. Um, so we can look at changes to the population over time and kind of compare the distribution of traits in order to see what type of selection we're looking at. So stabilizing selection occurs when the kind of middle trait of the population becomes much more common. So for example, a particular clutch size of robins becomes increasingly common because larger clutches are not really good and neither are smaller clutches. So larger clutches result in malnourished chicks and smaller clutches, there's a higher likelihood of them not being viable. Directional selection means going from one extreme to another. Um, so for example, those peppered moths we looked at, the original population was very light. The population after natural selection and the industrial revolution was very dark. So it went in one direction. And diversing, diversifying selection is kind of bimodal. Um, the original population had kind of a bell curve and in that the later population, kind of two extremes do better than the original population. There's also sexual selection, which results in sexual dimorphism, so very different males and females within the population. Um, you see this a lot in birds, uh, then also some mammals. Um, so for example, kind of larger antlers on elk. Um, and so the appearance of the males is often much more exaggerated. They put their energy into obtaining mates. Um, this kind of has to do with differences in production between sperm and eggs. Um, it's fairly easy for males to produce lots of sperm, um, and so uh, they're able to kind of spend their energy on processes that will facilitate them distributing that sperm. It's much more energy intensive for females to produce eggs, and so they want to protect those eggs and make sure that they make it to the place where they're going to be reproductively successful. Um, so they put their energy more into camouflage uh, and gestation and offspring. Okay, so that was it for evolution. Um, hopefully it cleared up some misconceptions that you might have had and shared some new knowledge with you. Um, make sure that you look over the last quiz feedback, listen to this lecture, um, check the study guide, uh, email me if you need any help. Please do the online reflection because it's really important for making sure you're prepared for both finals and complete the next quiz.